Woof, you weren't kidding when you said this deep dive request was a doozy. Islamic eschatology, huh? I gotta admit, the title alone kind of sends shivers down my spine. Ancient prophecies, talk of the end times, even got some modern Islamist pamphlets in the mix. This is, uh, this is gonna be fascinating. It's certainly a subject that's captivated, well, scholars and theologians for centuries, yeah. and for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these beliefs, they give us this really unique window into how different cultures try to, to grapple with these big questions, you know, like life, death, and what might be waiting for us uh, on the other side. All right. So before we dive headfirst into this treasure trove of texts you've sent over, I think we need like a roadmap, right, just to get our bearings. So when we say Islamic eschatology, who are the, the main players in this, uh, this apocalyptic drama? Well, picture this. A cosmic showdown. Good versus evil. And on the side of righteousness, you've got figures like the Mahdi. He's a, a guided savior figure. A lot of Muslims believe he's going to show up right when things are at their worst to uh, to restore justice and kick off this, this incredible golden age. And get this, in some traditions, he's got a bit of backup. Jesus. Wait, wait, hold on. Jesus. Like that, Jesus. Now, this, this is starting to sound like some serious crossover episode stuff. It's true. The uh. Quran talks about Jesus as a prophet. Yeah. And some Islamic traditions, they actually see him playing a part in the end times, often working alongside the Mahdi to uh, to defeat the forces of darkness. And I'm guessing those forces of darkness, they wouldn't be complete without, well, you know, the classic bad guy. Yeah. The Antichrist. Bingo. In Islamic tradition, he's called the Dajjal. He's this, this deceptive figure. The Dajjal emerges to lead people astray. Basically, he's the embodiment of, of chaos, temptation, all that bad stuff. And if that wasn't enough, we even have those uh, harbingers of destruction, Gog and Magog. They get thrown into the mix, too. Okay, Gog and Magog. Now, those names, they ring a bell, but I can't quite place them. It's like uh, something out of like an epic poem or maybe a really intense heavy metal song. You know, you're not far off. Those names actually appear in a bunch of different religious traditions. They're even in the Bible, actually. They're often shown as uh, as these powerful forces of well, chaos and destruction. So we've got these ancient prophecies, these figures, some familiar, some, well, not so much. And this big idea of a, a final showdown between good and evil. It's a lot to process. Where do these beliefs even come from? Well, like a lot of religious traditions, Islamic eschatology, it pulls from different sources. The Quran, of course, it's the holy book of Islam. It definitely touches on the end times, you know, mentioning things like the day of judgment. But mm. a lot of the really vivid details, the stories that really stick with you, they come from the Hadith. Now, for those of us who uh, haven't exactly been to Islamic seminary school, remind me, what exactly is the Hadith? So the Hadith, it's this collection of like sayings and stories. And all of them, they're attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, passed down through well, generations and generations. Think of it kind of like oral history, offering these glimpses into, into his life, his teachings, how he interpreted the Quran. So if I'm getting this right, the Quran is like the, the main text, the foundation, and then the Hadith is more like a commentary, adding in more interpretation, more details. Yeah, that's a that's a really good way to put it. But here's where things get really, really interesting. Unlike the Quran, which was, you know, super carefully recorded, the Hadith, it wasn't like officially written down right away. It was compiled over time, which means inevitably you get these these different chains of narration and, well, some variation in how how certain events, certain prophecies are actually described. So you're saying that even within Islam, there isn't just one single agreed upon version of what these end times prophecies mean, depending on which texts you're looking at. Exactly. And there's well, there's no better example of this than the figure of the Mahdi. OK, so tell me about this Mahdi. What makes him such a, a central figure in all of this? What makes him so complex? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? He's kind of like a Rorschach test. Some people, they see him as this peaceful reformer. They see he's going to usher in this era of, of justice and deep, deep piety. But others, they see a warrior king leading a, a divinely ordained army. He's going to completely wipe out evil. There's no one right answer. And I think that's exactly why he's been such a powerful symbol throughout history. Uh, so this isn't just some abstract theology seminar we're having. These beliefs about the end times, about the Mahdi's, they've actually had a real impact out in the world, haven't they? A hundred percent. And that brings us to a really, really crucial point. These, these end times narratives, they're not just stories. They've sparked social movements. They've toppled empires. And honestly, they're still shaping geopolitics today. OK, you've definitely got me curious now. Give me an example. Where have we seen these beliefs actually playing out in a major way? OK, well, let's take a look at the Sudanese Madia. Back in the late 19th century, 
you had this this incredibly powerful movement, both social and political. They were fighting against British colonialism. And at the heart of it all was this, this intense belief in a Mahdi figure. Hold on. So an entire movement resisting colonial rule, they rallied around someone they believed was the Mahdi. That's, that's amazing. Tell me more about that. So it's the 1880s. This, this Sudanese religious leader, his name was Muhammad Ahmad, he comes out and, and declares himself the Mahdi. He claims that he's this divinely appointed savior destined to free the Muslim world from oppression. Okay, I can definitely see how that message would resonate with people stuck under colonial rule. But what made this idea of the Mahdi so powerful? Well, think about it. For those Sudanese fighting this massive empire, the Mahdi wasn't just some abstract concept from theology. He represented hope. He was the living embodiment of their belief that God would intervene, that even against impossible odds, justice would win out. So in a way, believing in the Mahdi, that gave them the strength to fight back, to believe that change, real radical change, was actually possible. Precisely. And and the Sudanese Mahdi, it's not an isolated incident. Throughout Islamic history, the Mahdi has been this, this incredibly powerful force. He inspires hope. He incites rebellion. He challenges the status quo. It's a stark reminder that religious beliefs, especially ones tied to these ideas of salvation and apocalypse, they don't always stay on the pages of scripture. They have a way of spilling out onto the streets. So if the Mahdi is this sort of wild card, this figure who can inspire hope and, well, a whole lot of upheaval, where does that leave us today? Are there any any modern examples of this playing out? Oh, absolutely. And honestly, nowhere is it more evident than in Iran. But but to really understand why, we need to we need to delve into a particular branch of Islam. Ma. Shizism. You see, <laughs> within Islam there's this branch called Shizm, and they've got this this really specific belief in a fast called the Twelfth Imam. And they believe that he he is the Mahdi. Okay, well hold on a second. I'm trying to keep up here. Twelfth Imam Mahdi Iran. This is where it gets really interesting, isn't it? Right. right yeah. Walk me through this. Who is this twelfth Imam and what makes him so important in Iran? All right, so picture this. It's the ninth century and the eleventh Imam he dies. He leaves behind his son. This young boy, everyone believes he's the, the divinely chosen successor. This is the 12th imam. And then, well, he vanishes. Vanishes. Like, poof, gone. No explanation. Man, that's that's one heck of a cliffhanger. Right. It's a story shrouded in mystery. Shiite Muslims, they believe that the 12th imam, he didn't actually die. He went into hiding. It's called occultation. And they believe he's still out there just, just waiting for the right time to return as the Mahdi. Wow. So for centuries, Shiites have been living with this belief that that their savior, their money, could literally reappear at any given moment. Man, that's that's a powerful idea, especially when you think about how that could be used by, well, by leaders, by movements, anyone seeking legitimacy, anyone trying to challenge the powers that be. And that brings us to, well, modern day Iran. See, after the 1979 Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, he was the leader of the whole thing. He was incredibly skilled at framing this this brand new Islamic Republic in light of these messianic expectations that were already, you know, kind of simmering there. Okay, so we're talking about Khomeini, the cleric who became this this revolutionary icon. He leads Iran into this new era as an Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. How does he use these beliefs about the 12th Imam to his advantage? Khomeini, he was a smart guy, a brilliant strategist, really. He yeah. knew he knew how powerful it would be to tap into this this pre-existing belief in the hidden Imam. He starts working it into his sermons, his speeches. He starts suggesting that that the revolution itself it's a sign, a step towards the Mahdi's return. So he's basically saying, "Hey, look around. This revolution, this Islamic Republic, this is all part of God's plan. This is how we get ready for the Mahdi's comeback." Pretty clever. Play to those deep-seated beliefs. But didn't he didn't he take it even further than that? Didn't Khomeini call the United States the Great Satan? Now that that's some seriously loaded language right there. You're right. That Great Satan label. That wasn't just, you know, some offhand comment. It was calculated. Khomeini's way of framing the entire world in these these really black and white terms. Good versus evil. Believers against infidels. Iran against all the forces of corruption. And of course, who's leading those corrupt forces? Right. The United States. And guess who's gonna lead the faithful to victory over this great Satan? It's like he's he's literally placing himself into one of these apocalyptic prophecies we've been talking about. He's not just a a political leader anymore. Now he's this spiritual guide getting everyone prepped and ready for the Mahdi. Exactly. And that kind of rhetoric, it had a, a huge impact. It energized his supporters. It created this sense of urgency, of righteousness. Yeah. And, well, it also created this powerful us versus them mentality. 
It's not a coincidence that all of this apocalyptic talk, it ramps up during the revolution, especially during the hostage crisis with the United States. Right. Man, I remember learning about that in school. American diplomats held hostage in Tehran. Huge international incident. It's it's hard to even imagine what was going on back then without understanding the religious and ideological stuff that was like the backdrop for it all. And that's exactly why we're doing this deep dive, right? <laughs> to really grasp how these beliefs, these prophecies, they aren't just ideas in a book. They shape world events. And it doesn't stop with Khomeini either. Even after his death, the Iranian government, they kept cultivating this, this connection to the Mahdi. They even built a whole mosque dedicated to him. You're talking about the Jumkaran Mosque, right? Yeah, I read a bit about that. Tell me more. What's the significance of this place? So the Jumkaran Mosque, it's near the holy city of Kornarium. It's become like the spot for devotion to the 12th Imam. They say it's built on the exact spot where centuries ago, the 12th Imam appeared to a local leader. Now, pilgrims, they come from all over. They offer prayers. They leave letters in a special well, hoping those messages will somehow reach the hidden Imam himself. It's wild how a physical space can become so charged with, with religious meaning. And yeah. clearly the Iranian government, they're not blind to that. They know how powerful that symbolism is. Oh, they know. All right. They've poured a ton of resources into expanding that mosque, promoting it, making it a major pilgrimage destination. It's a way for them to, well, to tap into this, this deep longing for a messiah. And in a way, it's how they legitimize their own power. So the Iranian government has always been very, very careful to tie their claim to legitimacy to the Mahdi. But I remember back in like the 2000s, there was this whole other layer of, I don't know, Mahdi mania surrounding President Ahmadinejad. Didn't he claim that he'd actually seen the 12th Imam like face to face? Ugh. Ahmadinejad. Now, there was an interesting character. He was known for his, well, fiery speeches, his anti-West rhetoric. And yeah, he was very, very public about his belief that the Mahdi was coming back. Like any day now. I remember reading about those speeches. He'd talk about like current events, stuff in the news, and he'd spin it as like, see, that's a sign. The Mahdi's return is right around the corner. Exactly. And this wasn't just some political game he was playing. People who knew him, they said Ahmadinejad truly believed it. There were even these rumors going around that that he was trying to make the Mahdi come back faster with his policies. Hold up. Trying to like speed run the apocalypse. That's next level proactivity. But seriously, what was the thinking there? It's hard to say for sure. But some scholars believe that Ahmadinejad, he saw himself in this role of, you know, preparing the way for the Mahdi, just like Khomeini did. Mm. And his actions, his, well, confrontational approach to the West, his focus on nuclear ambitions. It all kind of makes sense if you view it through that lens. So this wasn't just some personal quirk of Ahmadinejad's. This had real consequences, increased tension with the West, even sparked fears of like a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Exactly. And that's well, that's the thing about these end times beliefs, these messianic expectations. They can be a powerful force and they're not always harmless when they get mixed up with political power, with national ambitions. That's when things can get really, really dangerous. And just to complicate matters even further, I mean, it's not like every single person in Iran buys into the government's whole Mahdi narrative, right? You're absolutely right. Even within Iran, you've got this whole spectrum of beliefs about this, mm. even among people who identify as Shiite Muslims. And a perfect example of that, well, it's in our sources, actually, the case of Saeed Mohammed Khazamani Borjurdi. Okay, refresh my memory. Who was he again? So Borjurdi, he's this Iranian cleric. And he also claims a connection to the 12th Imam. In fact, he actually says that he's the Mahdi's representative here on Earth. Now, you'd think a claim like that, that would put him right in line with the Iranian government, right? Yeah. I mean, they're all about this whole, the Mahdi's coming, get ready message. Mm -hmm. Right. But here's where it gets really interesting. Brujerdi, he uses his platform to criticize the Iranian government. He says they're corrupt, that they've strayed from true Islam. He even says they're not doing enough to prepare for the Mahdi's return, that they're more concerned with staying in power than with, you know, fulfilling their, their spiritual duty. Whoa, so he's he's using their own playbook against them. That's a bold move. Yeah. But it sounds like even in Iran, there are different ideas about what the Mahdi's return will look like, what it means for those in charge. So it's not as simple as saying Iran equals Mahdi equals some kind of apocalyptic threat, is it? You got it. It's way more complicated yeah. than that. But what Brugerdi shows us, it's this. It's dangerous when political leaders try to exploit apocalyptic beliefs to get what they want. It's a tale as old as time. 
And it's not just a problem in history books, is it? I mean, we see it happening today with extremist groups like ISIS. They twist religious texts and prophecies to justify the awful things they do. It's true. It's a sad fact, which is why it's so important to learn about these beliefs, to understand how they've been used and, well, abused. We're not trying to demonize any religion or belief system here. It's about developing what I like to call apocalyptic literacy. I like that. Apocalyptic literacy. All right, break it down for me. What does that even mean? It means being able to recognize the signs, the red flags, knowing when someone is manipulating these beliefs for their own gain, to incite violence, to oppress others. It's about understanding the history, the symbols, the different ways these beliefs have been interpreted. It's about asking tough questions and not just accepting everything at face value. So if we're more apocalyptically literate, we can start to see through the BS the propaganda, the fear-mongering, all those attempts to use these beliefs for bad stuff. Exactly. It's about being informed, being able to have these conversations with more nuance, more understanding. Because, let's be real, these beliefs, these prophecies, they're not just ancient stories. They're very much alive and well. They influence what happens in the world. They shape politics. And, yeah, they even spark conflict. No doubt about it. It's, it's what makes this whole topic so fascinating and, honestly, a little bit unsettling. You can say that again. So where do we go from here? We've talked about the origins of all this, the complexities of what's going on in Iran. What are some key takeaways for our listener? What do we want them to walk away with? I think for me, the big takeaway is we can't just brush the stuff aside, you know, these end times beliefs. It's not just like fringe stuff, ancient history we can ignore. It's woven into everything, geopolitics, social movements, even wars. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. We can't just dismiss these beliefs. It's tempting to think, well, I'm rational. I don't buy into prophecies, so none of this really matters to me. But it's not that simple. These beliefs have a way of, well, they shape what happens, even if we don't personally subscribe to them. It's like that saying, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it, right? But it's not just about remembering dates and names. It's about understanding how these, these powerful beliefs, these stories about the end of the world, they keep popping up even now. And that I think that leads us to the, the most important point of our deep dive today. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about how these old prophecies get, well, reinterpreted. People look at what's happening now and see those prophecies in a new light. But what if we flip that? What if instead of just looking at how the present changes our view of the past, hmm. we ask how these ancient beliefs are actually shaping how we see the world right now? Okay, yeah, I see what you're getting at. We tend to think about things in a straight line, right? The past affects the present. But what you're saying is these old stories about the apocalypse, they could be affecting how we interpret the headlines, the news, everything. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe it's even subconscious. But are we, without realizing it, are we filtering our understanding of everything? Global events, wars, even climate change. Are we seeing it all through the lens of these ancient prophecies? Do we see signs of the apocalypse everywhere? Because those stories, they've been ingrained in us for centuries. Man, that is a really interesting question. And honestly, I don't know if I have an answer for that. But it definitely makes you think, are we as a planet maybe a little obsessed with the end of the world? Right. And if we are, how does that obsession, how does it shape everything we do, our actions, our policies, our fears, even our hopes. That's something I'll leave with everyone listening today. Mm -hmm. A question to, to chew on, something to spark a little more exploration, a little more reflection. Love that, because that's what this deep dive is all about, right? It's not about just handing you answers. It's about giving you the tools you need to start asking your own questions. Think critically. Engage with the world in a, a, a more informed way. Couldn't have said it better myself. And honestly, never underestimate the power of a good question. Sometimes, Asking the right questions is way more important than having all the answers. Couldn't agree more. So to everyone out there listening, keep those questions coming. Keep exploring these topics, even if they make you a little uncomfortable sometimes. The world's full of mysteries, right? And digging into those mysteries, trying to unravel them. That's what makes life and learning so amazing. And on that note, we're going to wrap up our deep dive into Islamic eschatology. Thanks for joining us on this journey into, well, a really complex, really captivating subject.